Praise the Lord. That was beautiful music, wasn't it? Revive. Are you revived this morning? Yeah. I'm in jet lag. I got up at 1 o'clock, and when I get done here, if I can make it through, I'll go to take a nap. But you pray for me, okay? It's great to be with you, though, at PYC. Um, Janet and I were here. Was it 2015? We were at the, at the Thousand Missionaries campus, and what a blessing it was to us personally. We just love the GYC and the AYCs and the Indonesia YCs, and Europe's got them now, and, and Scandinavia. It's just amazing around the world how this movement has spread, and thank God you're part of it. And uh, we, we are so blessed. In fact, when we got the call in 2010 to go to the GC, Janet was really resisting. We didn't, neither of us wanted to do that, but she said, man, I just love working with the young people in Central California. She had lots of youth retreats and girls retreats and all this kind of stuff going on. And, but uh, God has let us keep working with young people, and we appreciate that. We're getting younger and better all the time, too. Did you notice that? And, yeah, so. Anyway, um, I learned something today. I, I, you know, wonderful prayer time this morning. I just, uh, I, you know, Melody, Jim, and Janet and I, we go to a lot of prayer rooms around the world, but Jim, this is one of the best ones I've seen. It really is powerful, and you guys come out at 5 o'clock. I mean, usually people are whining about 6.30, you know, so you're, you're uh, great soldiers for the Lord, and so powerful, isn't it, when we get together and pray like that? Then I got to be on Hope Channel for half an hour live this morning, and let's pray Filipinas. I learned how to say Filipino is Filipina. Is that right? I should say Filipinas, so... Anyway, um, I'm going to get to preaching here in a minute, but when I think of Filipinas, <laughs> I think of Central California, because when we were there, uh, they were such a blessing to us, the Fresno Phil Am Church and the, the other churches through the conference. My son, Zach, who's a young pastor today, was a little bit, getting a little bit um, experimental, shall we say, a little bit wild back in those days at Fresno Adventist Academy. And, uh, but he had a number of friends from the Filipino church, and it was a great blessing because they made him part of their extended family. We were gone a lot as conference president traveling around, but they always had him over, and he loved the potlucks. <laughs> he liked those egg rolls and all that stuff, and they really took him in as a family, and I think it helped to tie him during a difficult age from 17 to 21 that he went through there. But, so thank you. Uh, and around the world, everywhere we go, there are Filipinos. And, God has sent you out as missionaries everywhere now, and uh, we praise God for what you're doing. But we're not here to talk about you or me or anything else. We're just here to, to talk about Jesus. And um, I was glad I could squeeze this in, Jim. You know, it, when it came, I really felt like the Lord had canceled one thing so I could do this, and I I'm, I'm, wish I could be here longer. I've got to leave Saturday night because meetings we've got to be at Monday morning, and et cetera. But um, I just I wanted to be because I love, I'm energized by being with you, and it's already been a great blessing to me. So pray for me as I speak today. But, you know, I found one thing in speaking around the world, and Janet and I go to every country and a couple hundred thousand miles a year. We travel together working with pastors and their families and elders and all that. But I've discovered that it really isn't about the preacher. It's not really about great speakers or great gifts or anything like that. If it was, I wouldn't be uh, doing any of it. But it's about something Ellen White said a long time ago. She said, you can learn more from the Holy Spirit in one moment than you can learn from all the men of the world in a lifetime. That's pretty powerful stuff, and it's true. So this morning, as I begin, I've got things to say and a burden on my heart about the times we're living in. But what I want you to ask you to do is just stand with me for a moment, and in silent prayer, will you give permission to the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart? Scott talked powerfully about it last night. He will speak to you, and it may not be anything I say, but when he whispers, <laughs> you'll know, and I hope you'll respond. So stand with me. Let's just claim Luke 11. He said, ask, and you shall receive. And then he talked about the Holy Spirit and how the Father always will give us the Holy Spirit when we ask. And we've asked, we prayed this morning and all, but right now, Will you give him permission in this time to say to you whatever he wants to and to use me to and get me out of the way? So let's pray silently. Oh Lord, we are amazed that you want us. You're constantly waiting there drawing us when we kind of wander away and do other things, and thank you that you don't give up on us. And so today, uh, we're here in this environment, and we're 
We're being revived. It's a charged up environment. Thank you for that, Jesus. And thank you for these sincere young people. Inspire me and give me hope for this church in the last days. But right now, none of us are anything unless you speak to us. Fill us, Lord. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit this morning, each one of us, to be what you want us to be. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of my favorite stories is told by Tony Campolo. Have you heard of Tony Campolo? He's a rather well-known speaker, dynamic guy in, in America, religious teacher. And he tells about going to a Bible college to preach the graduation message. And he said, when I arrived there, he said, eight young men got me in a back room. And thank God for those of you that were praying with me over here. You have a good prayer team that it makes sure you're covered with prayer. He said, I need all the prayer I can get. It's good. They get, took me in a back room. They knelt around me, put their hands on my head, and they began to pray for me. And he said, that's good. I need all the prayer I can get. But he said, these young men, they were very earnest, very zealous. And he said, they prayed long prayers. Do you know what I mean? He said, they went on and on and on and on. And he said, the longer they prayed, the more tired they became. And they began to kind of lean on my head. And he said, I don't know if you've had eight young guys leaning on your head lately, but I wish they'd quit. It was heavy. He said, this one guy, he wasn't even praying for me. He was praying for some guy named Charlie Stolzfus. He said, oh, Lord, you know Charlie Stolzfus. He lives two kilometers down that road on the right-hand side in that little silver house. Lord, he left his wife and his three children this morning. God, step in. Do something. Save that family. Jesus, do something. When he got done praying, he prayed it again. He said, oh, Lord, you know Charlie Stolzfus. He, he lives two kilometers down the road on the right-hand side of that little silver house. Tony said, I felt like saying, what do you think? God's saying, what was that address again? You know, I missed that. Huh? He said, Lord, you know Charlie left his wife and his three children this morning. God, intervene, do something, save that little family. Jesus, help them. Finally, he got done. He quit praying, and he said the others quit finally. He was able to preach his message. And he said, I was getting in my car and headed home. And as I was getting on the highway, I was getting on the on-ramp. There was this man with his thumb stuck out hitchhiking. Do they do that in the Philippines? No, don't do that. In America, you stick out your thumb on the road and people will pick you up sometimes. He said, well, he said, I know you're not supposed to pick up strangers. That could be dangerous. They could, who knows what they'd do to you. So he said, but I'm a preacher. And he said, anytime I can get someone captive in my, in my car to tell them about Jesus, I do it. <laughs> so he said, I picked the guy up. We're headed down the road. I looked at him and I said, hi, my name's Tony. What's yours? And he said, my name's, what do you think? Yeah, Charlie Stolzfus. Tony said, my eyes got big and I looked at him. And I got off at the next exit. <laughs> and I went across the bridge and I headed back. And he got scared. He got up against the door. He said, mister, where are you taking me? Tony said, I'm taking you home. And he said, why? He said, because you left your wife and your three children this morning, didn't you? <laughs> and Charlie says, yes, how did you know that? And Tony says, God told me. Hmm? Yeah, wow. So then he said, I got off at the next exit on that road, two kilometers down the road, pulled in his driveway in front of his house. <laughs> he said, that blew his mind. He said, mister, how did you know I lived here? Tony said, God told me. Hmm? Yeah. So he said his wife came to the door, and she said, you're back, you're back, what happened? So Charlie whispered in his wife's ear, pointed at Tony, and told the story. So her eyes got big. She was shocked. Tony said, I said to that young couple, I said, now listen, you two are going to get in your house, sit down, I'm going to talk, and you're going to listen. He said, wow, did they listen. <laughs> it was like I was God himself or something. He said, that afternoon, I was able to lead those two people to Jesus Christ, and that guy's a preacher in California today. Hallelujah. Huh? Our Jesus can do anything <laughs> when his people call on him in prayer, huh? Yeah. God is so amazing. He came and gave up everything. He risked it all. Jesus could have lost. He could have been taken down. He could have yielded to temptation. And he did it all for you, <laughs> for one of us. What amazing love. Isn't it? Can you fathom that? It's crazy, isn't it? Why would he do that? He can't help it. He just is agape love. What a wonderful God. Um, look with me, if you will, Jeremiah 33.3. 3. It's, uh, 
text, promise. I mark my promises in blue in the Bible because so often I'm in trouble, I don't know what to do, and I just lip, open my Bible, and the promises begin to jump out at me and grab me, Jim. By the way, this Jim, he's been around helping us for so many years. General Conference, I think we actually hire you at the GC. They don't know that here, do they? He's with us for annual council and prayer times and goes around the world helping. We, we appreciate him so much. He's a wonderful man of God for us. But Jeremiah 33, 3. Look at that with me for a minute. One man said, this is God's cell phone number. He says, call to me and I will answer you. Do you believe that? I think you do. Man, you guys pray. I know that. Do you believe every time you call on God, he answers every time? Do hmm? you believe that? It's a little weak. Do you believe God answers every time you call on his name? Does he always say yes? No. Thank God, huh? I have a friend who said, God, if God really wanted to punish me, he'd answer all my prayers yes. <laughs> and that's true of me. I think back of those times that I pled with God, oh, I wanted this or I wanted that. And later I saw that was not what I should have. And God is too good. Sometimes he says, no, <laughs> I'm not going to give you what you want. Or I'll give it to you later. Or I'll give you something better. But he always answers. He always answers. And I love the rest of that promise. And show you great and mighty things which you do not know. I know you know this promise. And I'm not necessarily going to preach a lot of new and strange uh, interpretations of little passages today. I just want to remind you of what I believe is the most important set of truths in the universe today for us as Adventist Christians. Um, I love this text because it, it points to the fact that really prayer is all about a relationship with Jesus. And every time I take the time to spend time with him, he shows me things about himself, tells me about his personality. What a wonderful God. He has got a sense of humor. He, he surprises you. He, he's he's uh, always there kind of in different ways than you think. Some morning when I get up, I think he's really going to whack me good because I've been bad. You know what I mean? And that morning, he wraps me with grace. Some other morning, I come along, I think, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. And I start talking about Jim or somebody else, and then he knocks me down <laughs> with some rebuke. That's the way he is because he, he gives us the truth, always gives us the truth. But many times he's telling me about him, but other times he's telling me about me, and he's always giving me information. And I found that group prayer, as you're finding here with United Prayer, I know you do a lot of it here, often in that prayer time, God will speak through somebody else. He will give us some information. He will give us insight. He will, Ellen White says the reason that United Prayer is more powerful than even private prayer, she says, is because we need, number one, the unity that it brings, and secondly, we need the balance that it brings. Sometimes when we're praying, uh, we could get off track if we didn't have others to kind of gently balance us back. And that's, that's how we work together in the church. And so I'm so glad for GYCs, and I, I'm so glad that your leaders here are very supportive of it. And that's happening around the world. You know, started out with a little bit of tension on GYC and some of these things. But over recent years, with Elder Wilson and Finley and so many others, the youth guys for the GC have all been working to see that we, we work together. <laughs> It's a big church, and it's a massive world. We can't reach it by splitting off and criticizing each other. Thank you, PUIC, for being positive, supportive ministry, supportive of your church. And uh, I know your leaders see that, and our, our desire is that every part of the youth movement, we've got a great new youth team in the GC right now, Gary Blanchard and, and Paco from, from South, America, South uh, Africa. They just love these kind of movements and believe there's room for everybody. We have some different ways of doing things. We have different ways of, of burdens and what we like and what we do, but uh, God needs all of us to have our part in his kingdom, part of the, of the body of Christ. So thank you for being that kind of a ministry. And that's why I love to come here. Um, <clears throat> I want to take you today to a passage, that, a set of chapters that is so familiar. You might say, why did you come from Washington, D.C. on a long flight to preach something we've already heard? But again, I believe it's so critical. And so I want to take you to John uh, chapter 13 to 17 in the two times I have with you in the main meetings. And uh, I want to remember, remind you about Jesus on his way to Gethsemane that last night. The last few hours he had with his disciples. And he knew that he was going to die. It would be their most difficult test. It would try them to the very end. And they were also supposed to then plant <laughs> the New Testament church 
So as they're walking to the upper room, he's planning to give them the last words of, of most important instruction. Let me ask you, if you knew you were going to die uh, in a couple or three weeks, what would you do? Or in a few hours? <laughs> I would want to gather my family, my loved ones. I got a wonderful wife. She's a wonderful woman of God, world prayer coordinator, because God changed her life so dramatically through God's people's prayers for her and, and just drives her. And, but I got two sons and two wonderful daughter-in-laws and five grandchildren. I got two new grandchildren just in January, little identical twins. Praise God. I'll show you pictures if you want to see them. But um, I, I'm so thankful for my family. But if I only had a little while before I died, I'd want to gather them. And I'd want to share with them the most important things I'd learned in my life and my ministry that could help them get through. Right? That's what Jesus was doing. This was going to be a summary a will and testament, if you will, of his most important teachings coming up. As he's on the way to the upper room, his disciples are falling back. And what are they doing? What are they doing? On the way to his Gethsemane? They're arguing about what? Who's going to be the next executive secretary of the conference? <laughs> you would never do that in the Philippines, would you? Or in your local church. Who will be head elder this time, I wonder? Will I still get to be or will somebody else? Or who's going to be head deaconess? Or Jesus' heart must have been broken, don't you think? <laughs> His heart was so burdened with the ultimate truths of eternity and the difference between life and death at the cross and the New Testament church, and they're talking about who's going to lead the church, and they don't even know what the church is. <laughs> they don't even understand the church, and they want to be the president. <laughs> We're that way sometimes. We want to lead, but we don't even really know the depths of what God needs and what he wants in his leaders. Help me, Lord, when I'm that way. Anyway, he calls him on it, takes him up to the upper room. He's gentle as he always is, but he knows he's got to do some work in a hurry. They're not ready. So what does he do? Chapter 13, what's he doing? Kneeling before his betrayer, who's just gone and made a deal. He's so smart, he's going to force Jesus to be king. 30 pieces of silver, and now he kneels and washes his filthy feet. One last time, he's trying to love Judas not to do it. It says Jesus loved them to the end. Wow, what a God. Humility, self-sacrifice, self-giving love, that's his ultimate lesson, isn't it? Yeah, that's what he did in the 13th chapter. But Judas goes out. He's uh, going to go ahead. Money's more important. Power is more important. So he's got the 11 in the upper room, and what does he do then? I just want to look at a few verses here quickly with you. So look at John 14. Now Jesus is trying for the 11, get them ready to do the work they've been called to do. Love those verses in verses 1 to 3. Can you say them with me? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so... I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, hallelujah, and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That is good news this morning, amen? Do you know that you're going to be saved? Huh? Do you have assurance? We sang Blessed Assurance in the prayer time. I love that song. We sing it often. Do you have a blessed assurance, or are you anxious? <laughs> are you thinking, I'm not going to make it. I'm too bad a sinner. I come to meetings like this many times. I think, wow, God, I did it again. I just failed. I've let you down so much all the time. How can I ever make it? How can you trust me in heaven? Maybe you feel that way this morning, but I tell you, Jesus says, I will come and get you. He says in, in uh, Philippians 1, 6, I will finish the work I've begun in you. If you'll let me, you'd have to fight me to stop me, but I will finish the work until the day of Jesus Christ. I, that's the good news for you this morning. Jesus gives you assurance. He wants you. He will do everything in his power to save you. And only your stubborn obstinance and choosing to leave him will cause you to be lost. I hope none of you are, but I hope this morning you go out of here sure that you're covered with Jesus righteousness today. It's hard to witness, hard to go out and serve. You guys are out on the streets giving out glow tracks. Hallelujah. Uh, we helped start those. God, God helped start them in Central Cal when I was there, and it was just a miracle the way it got going. Now there's 100 million of them in different languages around the world. It's, it's amazing. Just from some young adults that caught a vision, and we were seeing a miracle prayer for, for our evangelism offering. But, you know, 
passing out tracts and talking to people doesn't work if you don't have the joy of knowing that you're covered by the righteousness of Jesus. You've got to understand that yourself to be able to. Otherwise, you're saying, come and join this and try real hard and you might make it. <laughs> no, that doesn't win people today in this world. Okay, so first off, he says, I'm coming again and I'm going to get you. And i got to building a mansion for you. If you think you're poor, you've got a mansion. Okay, you know all this. Then verses 12 to 14, here's where he gets into the part I wanted to talk about especially today. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. Wow. He just raised Lazarus from the dead. I was reading this morning just my own worship about Mary again and Simon and Lazarus at that feast, and there's Jesus sitting between Simon, who he'd healed from the worst disease in the world, <laughs> just debilitates you completely, um, leprosy. On the other side is Lazarus, just been raised from the dead after four days. And Mary, who had had seven demons cast, cast out of her seven times, and now she's doing this wonderful act for Jesus. But I think how despicable was the criticism of Simon and of Judas there at that table. I can't believe that we are that way sometimes. But anyway, it goes on, verse 13 and 14. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Do you believe that? That was weak. Do you believe those promises? He said it twice. Yeah. And then it goes on. Look in chapter 15. You know this well. We talk about this in Sabbath school, in school. We can quote it. We sing songs about it. Verse 5. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. Are you bearing fruit? If you're abiding in Jesus, you will. Holy Spirit will do it. For without me, you can do how much? What's the heart language here in Ilo Ilo? What is it? How do you say nothing in your heart language here? Voila. 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 Jesus says, if you abide in me, you will bear fruit. But if you don't, voila. 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 You can do nothing. Do you believe that? Why do we keep rushing off and skipping worship? Why do we go so often without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, pleading for it every day? Why do we go off in our own strength to hold meetings and to brag about what we've done in God's ministry? Why do I do that? Why do I rush... Get up in the morning. People are calling me from Asia on my cell phone. So I, oh, I've got to answer quick. The office is closing. So I cut short my time with Jesus or I'm distracted. I'm working on something else. And then I come back and, Lord, help me. <laughs> help me to realize that unless I connect to the vine in a major way, unless I'm pleading for the baptism of the Spirit every day, I can do voila or whatever it is. Yeah, nothing. Verse 7 and 8, again, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. You can ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. There's number three, huh? How about that? By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. You can ask anything. But then, verse 16, he says it again. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Four times now, in the most important last words of Jesus to his disciples, he says, if you just connect with me. You can ask. Please ask. Do you know in chapter 16, he says that three more times? Almost the exact same promise. Seven times, you Seventh-day Adventists. Is that significant? Seven times in Jesus' most important summary of instruction, he says, if you will just abide in me and let me abide in you, you can ask anything in my name and I will do it. Hallelujah. How's it going with you and your church? Are you seeing miracles? Are you seeing big things enough for the God of the universe? Or are we just planning things that we could do in our own strength in case the Holy Spirit isn't there? Huh? I ask myself that question. I ask my church that question. How are we doing, Lord? Wow. Well, a lot more I could say here, but I need to run on. Um, did you get the handout? Did they pass the handout to everybody? Is the handout out? Yeah, okay. Look on there. I want, I want to read several of these texts with these uh, statements from Ellen White. Some of my favorite ones, Janet and I put this together, this sheet, and I hope you'll keep it. One reason I do this instead of a PowerPoint is because PowerPoints you won't remember tomorrow very well, but you can keep this in your Bible, in your prayer room, 
and you can go over it, meditate on it. You have something a hard copy. And the first sentence or two is my own. Inspired writings <clears throat> and experience make it clear that two principles must be applied for all our ministries to be most fully used and empowered by the Holy Spirit. One, much personal and united prayer. And two, much lay member involvement. <laughs> Best work for the pastors, we tell them this all over the world, is to put your people to work. If you're hovering, if you're trying to do it all, you should be fired. That's what Ellen White said, gospel workers. Huh? It's what she said. It's tough. Ministers should train and equip, not try to do it all. Then it goes on. Number one, uh, what the Lord did for his people in that time, the early church, is just as essential and more so he do for his people today. All that the apostles did, every church member today is to do. Wow. How is it going in your church? What did they do in the New Testament? I don't have any money, but what I have I give you. Rise. Take up your bed and walk, and they were healed. Uh, they opened jail doors by prayer. They, they healed, and they even raised the dead. And the work, work, the work went forward dramatically. In 25 years, went to the whole world in the midst of terrible persecution, not even in a receptive society. Mm. Number two, you know this statement so well. Revival of true godliness among us, the greatest, most urgent of our needs. This should be our first work. Heavenly Father is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to them than ask him, the earthly parents, to give a good gifts. The last sentence, a revival need be expected only in answer to what? Much prayer. I, I, they asked me what the title of the sermon was, and because I was on Hope Channel, I said, it's, let's pray Filipinas. <laughs> oh, you already stole that title from me, didn't you? It's unleashing God's power. That's what prayer does. I don't know how it works, but when we pray, something happens in heaven that unleashes God's power to do things he can't do otherwise. Do you believe that? Yeah. Angel Rodriguez, uh, head of BRI, said one day we were riding along in Nigeria talking about prayer, and he said, I believe that the great controversy has rules of war just like any other war. They're called rules of engagement. And if you break those rules, you can be charged with war crimes. And he said, God set up some rules, and one of them, one of the main ones is you have not because you ask not. All our planning, all of our thinking, all of our stuff should be done just the way Scott said last night, listening to God as we do it. Praying and then being quiet, going to his word, and he will speak to us. Anyway, the sheet goes on. There's lots of things we could read here, but number three is powerful. At the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembles. You go home and you want to pray more with your people in the church and everything, let me tell you, Satan will get so scared, he'll give you no end of grief, right? He will try to find every way to stop you from praying because he knows when you do that, it unleashes God's power. Great things happen that can't happen unless we call on his name. Then number four and five, you can see them all there. But the one I want to look at real closely right now is number nine. This one convicts me every time. I've heard Jim use it in the prayer times too. Maybe he did this week. I don't know. But it's so powerful. An intensity such as never before was seen is taking possession of the world. In amusements, money-making, the contest for power, and the very struggle for existence, there's a terrible force that engrosses body and mind and soul. In the midst of this maddening rush, God is speaking. He bids us come apart and commune with him. Be still and know that I am God, Psalms 46.10. Then this next paragraph I've bolded because it so convicts me every time I read it. Many, even in their seasons of devotion, fail of receiving the blessing of real communion with God. Real communion, what does that mean? Not just putting in our time, reading a little devotional, spewing a few words of God and taking off. They're in too great haste. With hurried steps, they press through the circle of Christ's loving presence, pausing perhaps a moment within the sacred precincts, but not waiting for counsel. <clears throat> waiting for counsel. What does that mean? You're planning PUIC as we're planning meetings of the GC as you're planning your local church Sabbath school. <laughs> waiting for God to destruct, instruct you with new thoughts and things that are deeper, things the Holy Spirit wants done. They have no time to remain with the divine teacher. With their burdens, they return to their work. These workers can never attain the highest success until they learn the secret of strength. They must give themselves time to think, to pray, to wait upon God for a renewal of physical, mental, and spiritual power. They need the uplifting influence of his spirit. Receiving this, they will be quickened by fresh life. The wearied frame and tired brain will be refreshed. The burdened heart lightened, like plugging into the cell phone charger. Not a pause for a moment in his presence but personal contact with Jesus to sit down in companionship with him. This is our need. Is that your need? I bet you're busy, aren't you? Satan, we're told by Ellen White, since he fell, has been involved in ceaseless activity with no time for reflection. She goes on to say, 
he tries to do the same thing to us. Get us so busy working for Jesus in our special ministries, in our, in our work for God, that we really aren't taking time for communion, not to really know him. Uh, Lord, help me to not just talk about it, to not just say, yes, I can do nothing without Jesus, but to really do it, to change my life, and to really prioritize time. It means going to bed earlier at night. It means eating right. It means lots of things. If the mind is going to be able to commune early in the morning and start that day with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I was a young <clears throat> departmental guy in Colorado, um, just over 30 years old. I went up to uh, Glacier View Ranch up in the Rockies for a minister's meeting. When I got up there, um, I was staying in a room with two beds in it. The man in the other bed was the educational director for the conference. Janet wasn't with me. In the middle of the night, I had this dream, and I was so sure it was really happening. You had those kind of dreams? In my dream, I dreamt that it was Janet in the other bed, not Bob. And uh, I, be I was excited about that. And I, I got up out of my bed, and I began to sleepwalk across the room towards poor Bob, thinking it was Janet. Yeah. I got over there in the darkness. I was still asleep, standing over Bob. He was still asleep. And I was so excited. I love Janet a lot. <laughs> She's a wonderful wife. So I began to crawl in bed with Bob. That woke him up. It woke me up. Bob, he's got a great sense of humor. He said, Jerry, I won't tell anybody. And I said, no, Bob, I'm going to tell everybody at breakfast before you get a chance to tell it your way. And that's what I did. I gathered all the pastors together, and I told them about my sleepwalking experience. And the reason I share that with you, my young friends, is because over my life, I look back now and I see how often I thought I was awake when really I was asleep. Do you hear me? Often thought I was awake as a Christian, but God would come and whisper in my ear in the middle of a meeting and say, Hey, Mr. President, you're becoming a bureaucrat. <laughs> Wake up. Listen to me. Hear what I'm saying. See with my eyes. My vision is so much better than what your machinery here is doing. How is it with you? Are you really awake? Paul said in Romans 13, it's high time to wake out of sleep. <laughs> now is the time to put off our works of darkness and to move forward with Jesus in a powerful way. I won't take long with this because my time's running, but I uh, grew up in a preacher's home. And uh, my folks were active. My, my dad was a publishing director, and he was on fire for God. He'd been converted recently, and they were out with the literature evangelist. My mother was a, an Adventist school teacher. They were busy for God and his work, but they left me at home watching TV and running around with the wrong boys. They didn't get me involved in the ministry. They didn't challenge me to do anything exciting as a young leader in the bud. And so I got more and more rebellious. I didn't want the church. I didn't want Jesus because I didn't know him. My mother didn't have assurance of salvation. She didn't think she'd be saved. And I was home with her most of the time. And <clears throat> not only that, but it just didn't seem adventurous. I mean, <laughs> the church meant giving up this and giving up that and going to church and not doing much. And so I got rebellious, and I got into all kinds of trouble. I won't detail how bad a boy I was and everything, but I can tell you it wasn't good. I got kicked out of three of our academies. And each time my parents said, now, which Adventist school do you want to go to next? <laughs> I believed in education. It kind of kept me close to the, to the culture. But got more and more rebellious with drinking and smoking and drugs and the whole thing. By the time I got to college, I wanted out completely. I, I made sure everybody knew I didn't want anything to do with God. I was living with a bunch of my friends, backslid and Adventists, and we were buying and selling drugs and stealing cocaine and selling it on the back streets. The treasurer's son got killed in a, in a drug deal. But my parents did something really right. They, they didn't do everything right, but when they saw how far gone I was, they panicked and they got everybody they could praying for me. All the literature evangelists in the central part of the U.S. and all the teachers and the friends pray for my boy Jerry. They didn't hide it. They didn't try to, to, to keep it a secret. They just said, my boy is lost. Help us. Pray for him. You know some people today that are lost? <laughs> some loved ones. Maybe it's a brother, sister, parent. Maybe it's a spouse. I tell you, don't give up. The Bible says two or three come together. We pray for a soul, this one and that one. We'll see God moving on those hearts. They claim the promises like Isaiah 42. You'll open blind eyes. He'll set the captives free. He'll make the crooked things straight. I'll bring back the backslider from his way. 
Yeah, I could tell you a lot more, but I won't take the time. But God finally made me miserable. Hallelujah. And I was not enjoying it. My girlfriend and I had a really bad psychedelic drug trip. At the end of that day, we were sitting in our apartment. We said, what is going to make us happy? <laughs> we thought if we got away from all this church stuff, we'd be happy, but we weren't. As we sat there talking, God brought to our mind that all the people who had worked for us, loved us no matter how, what we did, were Adventist Christians. The little lady that brought us food and the Bible worker that my dad sent to try to get us back. And our parents who stuck with us even though we were very mean to them. So anyway, that night sitting there, we decided maybe what we're looking for is love. And we remembered from our training, train up a child the way you should go, that God is love. And that night we decided to give God a chance. And the Bible worker, we'd been pretty mean to him when he came to the door, slammed the door in his face. He finally came back and he said, listen, you're going to need me someday. And when you do, call me. And he put his card in my pocket. He says we called him at 3 in the morning that day. He said, okay, come, start studying with us. And we began Bible studies, got involved in a little church they had there in Denver. They were on fire with the love of Jesus. And they just grabbed us in. They didn't care. We had, I had a long hair and a beard and come out of the rock music. And, but they just loved us in. If we didn't come to the small groups, if we didn't come to church service, they were on the phone calling us, drawing us back. Brother, you got a story too. And God is so good when he comes after us. A few months later, I was being baptized again by my dad. Tears running down his face. I just thank Jesus. When I think about my life, you know, the, the way I was headed with the kinds of drugs I was taking and the kind of risks we were taking could have been so different in my life. But Jesus got me just in time. So I just challenge you, parents, grandparents, whatever. You know, so I was listening last night. It just dawned on me again. You know, Scott, Scott's a pretty special person to our family. Um, he's actually related to me through marriage. But... Um, Janet, when we went to Central California, there were a lot of problems in the conference, lots of mess, a lot of ways, and we just cried out for prayer partners to help us. They began to pray for us, and one lady that just really got close to Janet was Laurel Myers. That's Scott's grandmother. She came to all the prayer groups each week, and she was there, and they were on the phone together. Laurel prayed and prayed and prayed for Scott and Tommy, her grandchildren that were lost in Hollywood. <laughs> Janet prayed with her for at least eight years straight for those kids. But one day they came back. <laughs> Hallelujah. Janet can tell you stories the rest of the month of how praying long for somebody, and they come back. Husband, Filipino husband, by the way, had left his wife in Central. But the father, you'd know his name if I called it out, was a pastor. He pled with the prayer partners, pray for my son-in-law to come back. One year, two years, four years, six years, seven years they were praying for the son-in-law. Everybody's going, come on, he's not coming back. And he came back. Hallelujah. God can do it. He saved Scotty just in time and Tommy, Jerry. And if he can save us, he can use us. He could use David after he committed adultery and murdered somebody. He can use you. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter how far gone your brother is or some other loved one. Pray like crazy. Get many people praying. There's number six on that sheet says there's more power in united prayer. We know that. That's the way it works. Well, anyway, um, we could tell you lots more stories. Janet has become a great prayer warrior partly because she'd gotten so discouraged. When I was elected a president at 36 in Pennsylvania, I thought things were going pretty good, but I was so insensitive as a husband, I didn't realize my wife had given up. She'd been trying for years to get it together with Jesus and just couldn't seem to do it in her own prayer life. She decided, I'm not going to be saved. She'd given up. She didn't even want to live anymore. If you've heard her testimony, she's going to take the kids to church because she was a preacher's wife. She couldn't get out of that. But God's people that year at camp meeting when I was elected president, you know, they were coming around telling Janet, oh, how's it feel to be the first lady? And congratulations. And she wanted to throw up. You know, it just made her sick because she said, you don't know what's going on in me. But that year at camp meeting, a speaker, Dave Walkowitz, called them all to pray at 6.15 for their new leaders, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on our lives. And they came up telling Janet by the end of that week, listen, we've committed to pray for you and Jerry oh, every morning. For the next two years, everywhere we went, we're praying for you. Our small groups are praying for you guys. Thank you, thank you. But her life was turned upside down after two years. And if you know Janet... <laughs> You know, God has sent her on a life journey now that's just amazing, on fire for Jesus, from wanting not to live, 
to be on fire for God. So don't give up on anybody. And don't believe your leaders don't need a lot of prayer. They do. They're having family troubles. They're having things like just everybody else. So uh, remember that. And work with them. So a lot more stories I could tell you, but you know about answered prayer. I hope you have. When you go home, don't get discouraged trying to call your whole church to pray. That doesn't work very well usually, you know? Find God's leading, listen to his voice, and find two or three prayer partners that you will know will stick with you. And then plan, devil's going to make it hard for you, but pray. And then write down the requests and the promises, and when the answers come, let the church know what's happening. When they see results from prayer, they'll want in. You just have a big meeting and try to get them all there. It'll pitter down to nothing, and everybody say, oh, that didn't work. But if you start small and let God give you answers to prayer, let the miracles roll, and you tell them what's happening, and they see people in the baptistry, then they're all going to come flooding into the early prayer room, right? That's what happens. So God bless you as you do that. One last thing in these last few minutes I want to get to. Um, so I became a young pastor. I thought Jesus was coming right away. I didn't think there was time to go to seminary, but you can see that wasn't true, right? <laughs> the years have rolled by. Um, but I wondered at the time, how long will it be till Jesus comes back? So what do you think today? How long will it be till Jesus comes back? You think he's coming soon? Think he's coming soon? You haven't seen the political scene lately if you don't think so, right? <laughs> a lot of crazy people out there. But Pray for us in America. Will you do that? Because we need a lot of help over there. But how soon do you think he's coming? You know, I, I've wrestled with that question for some time. You look at the signs, Matthew 24, and really they've all been fulfilled, haven't they? I mean, the Pope, Protestants are reaching their hand across the Gulf. The next thing that's supposed to happen is Satan's miracles come out. In October of 18, I think it was, or 17, they signed this agreement, the Methodists and the Lutherans and all them, that they agree with the Catholics now on justification by faith. Help us, Lord. But it's happening. Pentecostals are saying, yes, let's get united. We'll worry about doctrine later. So it's all happening. All the signs are there, except for one. What's that? Matthew 24, 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then the end will come. How, how's that going? You know, I think back to those early pioneers when they were told after their potatoes were in the field and they were discouraged that that was their commission to take the three angels to the whole world. That was impossible, wouldn't you say? No money, mocked by everybody around them. They weren't Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists, by the way. They were just Adventists. But, um, man, what God has done. Janet and I travel this world. Every crazy place we go, from the heart of the Congo with little pygmies, village where our four-wheel drive broke down, we were almost kidnapped, but... We found a little church and a little school in that village. Uh, Pakistan, everywhere we go, there's a little Adventist clinic and church and school. God has taken this message so many places. When you see global mission, how many countries we've entered and all, we get proud. We think, boy, we're doing good, Lord. We've been in 900 and some languages and 2 million students in our schools. And we're in all these countries and all this stuff now. And every 28 seconds, somebody's being baptized as an Adventist. Hallelujah. Every two and a half hours, a new church is being planted. Thank God. But I just got done spending a couple of weeks in China, Hong Kong, and then we went to Tibet. Went on a prayer tour through Tibet, a large part of China that has no work whatsoever. Middle East, 500 million people. We have 4,000 members and 45 churches, I think it is, in the whole of the Middle East. And then on up through the Istan countries and up through India, where it's closing down in India, they have to sign a non-conversion. You won't evangelize anybody when you go there now. China, the same thing. They're closing it down and persecuting the Uyghurs and others. You say, God, China and India alone are one-third of the world's population. There's 1.8 billion people that still have never heard the name of Jesus. Did you hear that? 1.8 billion people have never even heard the name of Jesus? Okay, so how long is it going to be till Jesus comes? Hmm? Are we kidding ourselves? We're working hard. We try to reach everywhere. Philippines, you've got a pretty receptive culture, but I tell you, some of the cultures, they don't want anything to do. Japan, <laughs> in those places, they're so secular. Well, why did I bring that up? Because I, I can give you an answer quickly, I think. I was thinking about that, stirring on it. We'd been in Congo. We went someplace we shouldn't have gone and nearly got in trouble. But I was, I was down in Tanzania after that, and I, I said, I asked a group of leaders in Tanzania, Africa, I said, how long will it be, do you think? 
Jesus said he wanted to come back in the 1800s, right? Told, gave Ellen White a vision, said he wanted to come back in 1857 and then in 1901 and 1888. So if he wanted to come back long ago, over 100 years ago, and hasn't come back, why not? What's he waiting for? And I asked them a question. I didn't plan to. It wasn't in my notes. But I said, you know, if, if it was Barack Obama that was president, that was several years ago, I said, but I would say it to you today, if Donald Trump was assassinated today, how long do you think it would take for every villager in the world to know that? Huh? How long do you think? And we said two minutes. One guy said two days. The rest of them said, no, no, not that long. Another man said one day, no. Others said hours. And this is Africa. Short rate radios, all the different ways. <laughs> if a great event or two of great miracles happen, the whole world would know in a week. So if God wanted to come back in the 1800s, <laughs> and with one or two massive miracles in Iloilo, <laughs> Raise somebody from the dead. Something that CNN would catch right away. How long would it take for the whole world to be talking about the Adventist message? <laughs> so, if God wanted to come back, and if he could, with a couple of miracles, get the whole world talking about it right away, why doesn't he do it? Are you still awake? Why doesn't he do it? I believe. It's only maybe one reason, but I believe it's because we talk about Joel 2. We talk about what it says and say we should do that, but we aren't really doing it. Will you look at it with me just in closing? Another five minutes. Joel 2. You know, the enemy's coming in. The locusts have eaten the crops. There's no tithe coming into the sanctuary. So he says in chapter 1, verse 14 of Joel, Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Praise God, I see you have not only every morning a prayer time, a major prayer time early in the morning, but you also have several hours on the last morning. Hallelujah for that. This says call the bridegroom out of the bride chamber. Get serious about prayer and fasting and confession of sin. He says turn away from your wicked ways. Then <laughs> the world will no longer say where is their God. Look at, look at what it says, chapter 2 there. Um, it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm. Verse 12 and on says, Therefore turn to me with all your heart with weeping, fasting, and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Blow the trumpet, verse 15 of chapter 2. Consecrate a fast. Call the sacred assembly. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Verse 17, Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. And then farther down that verse, it says, why should they say among the people, where is their God? What happens in your church when some guest comes in? What do they think when they come into your church? Do they think, wow, that was good music, well-organized service, nice sermon. But do they go home saying, I don't know, though, I didn't see... Sense the power of God, maybe his presence. I didn't see lives being changed dramatically. It's just a, a nice oiled machine there. Or do they see the power of Acts happening in your church? The upper room experience that happened in the book of Acts. The things that happen there have to happen. They confess their sins to each other. Got it all cleaned up. They prayed much. They praised. They studied the word of God and they talked about mission. And then, as Jesus said, don't go until you're baptized by the Spirit. They were baptized by the Spirit, and things broke loose. And the rest of the chapter 2 there says, Then, when that happens, the Lord will be zealous for his people, pity his people. And then verse 27, Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God. And it shall come to pass afterward, I'll pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your young PYC daughters and sons will prophesy. Your old men like Jerry Page will dream dreams. And also on my servants, my men servants and maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit and all will be saved that should be saved. I believe it's time to stop talking about it and have the intensity and the earnestness to really do it. The confession of sin that says I'm going to turn from it, God, by your grace. I'm going to stop just talking about it and whining about it. 
I'm going to call the people to really pray and to intercede. When you go home from GYC will be the test. When Jim is leading it and you've got a three-hour prayer time or a one-hour prayer time, hey, that's great. We come together. We're, we're, it's a few of us, and we're in, we're in sync. When you go home, you'll fight the devil. He hates prayer. But grab a few around you who are intensely will intercede. Most revivals have been started by a small group of people who took it so seriously that they wept and stayed up all night, like this says the pastors, weeping all night long over their people. Lord, help us. John Maxwell said, a great church growth leader in North America, he said, um, the early disciples prayed for 10 days. Then they preached for 10 minutes, and thousands were converted. He said, today we tend to preach, pray for 10 minutes, <laughs> preach for 10 days or 10 weeks, and we're lucky if we get any. A.W. Tozer said, 95% of what goes on in the Christian church today would continue on if the Holy Spirit was not there. Huh? We got plans, we got methods, even for Christ's method. We got evangelistic plans we can do. So we, we sort of run our programs knowing what we'll get, have our percentages down. But he said 95% of what happened in the New Testament would have stopped immediately if the Holy Spirit wasn't there. Look at, look at it again, a process always there, problem persecution, an obstacle. The people would gather together. They would pray. They would intercede. The Holy Spirit showed up. The Word of God went forth with power. And then there was persecution, but there was conversion, and the church grew dramatically. So here's the question as we close. Are you willing with me to go into the upper room in a major way when you go home from this place? This is an upper room. A lot of the things happen here that happen there, but it'll be next week. And after that, so would you just kneel with me for a minute, talk to the Lord. We ask him to speak to us. You just respond. Lord, is there a sin in my life that I really need to give to you? I've been talking about it, even praying about it, but I've got to give it to you. And Lord, is there more time with you to be spent? Whatever. Let's just talk to Jesus as we close. Let's kneel together. Lord, we've <clears throat> talked to you about these things before, but it's time. We believe you're coming very soon. You're not going to wait much longer for your people. But I believe in mercy you're waiting a little longer. We want as many of us as possible to really do Joel 2, to really get involved, to wait in that upper room until we're baptized with the Spirit before we go anywhere, and then to go in the power of the book of Acts. Bless this group, Lord. Anoint them. Help them to go home to live it, not just to have a good experience for four or five days, but to change their world for you, Jesus, just like the disciples and the early Christians did. Help me, Father, not just preach it, but to live it. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.